I have a problem. My GPU is pretty good, but the drivers are broken. To render the world in my Minecraft clone at full render distance, it takes at least 4 gigabytes of VRAM. The thing is, my GPU has 8 gigabytes of VRAM, but it has a terrible bug that crashes my game at 4 gigabytes of usage. So it's time to optimize. Each chunk is made of a mesh, which is a large array of floating point numbers, each taking 4 bytes for each number. So far, each vertex is made of 3 floats for X, Y, and Z, 2 floats for texture coordinates, and 1 floats for the ambient occlusion shading. Each face of the block takes 2 triangles of 3 vertices each, meaning 6 sets of 6 floats, which equal to 144 bytes each. But we can reduce this. Two of the vertices are shared between the two triangles, which is where the index buffer objects come in. Index buffer objects allow the mesh to specify each vertex only once and then say which indices to define the order to render the vertices in. As a result, we don't need to specify the attributes of each vertex more than we need to. To draw a face, we need four vertices and six indices. As a result, each face is four sets of six floats plus six integers, which is a total of 120 bytes, so a 16% improvement. Right now, we are specifying three floats for the coordinates x, y, and z, but with vertex compression, we can reduce it to just one float. At the moment, I've increased the size of each chunk to 64 cubed, so we know each coordinate can run from 0 at the start of the chunk to 65, which is at the end of the chunk, plus the width of the block. Knowing this, we can split a 32-bit float into three 10-bit numbers that represent this range. 2 to the 10 is equal to 1024, which means that we can have 1024 discrete numbers in the range 0 to 65. We can convert each coordinate into a bit packed integer by multiplying by 1024, dividing by 65, and then casting to an integer. Then we combine the three integers together with bit shifts and set it off to the shader as a float, which reverses the process to get back the original floats with some precision loss. This leaves a face with six indices and four vertices of four floats each, making a total of 88 bytes each, a 38% improvement from the original. There's one last thing we can do to cut our VRAM usage, and that's greedy meshing. Greedy meshing combines faces that can be merged into a larger square. First, while adding blocks, if it has a cube model and has greedy meshing enabled, instead of directly adding the vertices to the mesh, we add the faces to an array for that particular face direction. While adding the faces, we check if it can be combined for the last face in the array via the Z direction, and if so, replace the last face with a merged one instead of adding a new one. The merge check makes sure that the block is of the same type, the face direction is the same, the ambient occlusion is the same, and the faces are adjacent in the Z direction. The ambient occlusion check calculates the bitmap of diagonal blocks for both faces and returns true if they are both the same. After adding faces, we combine for the X and Z directions and what we have left is a greedy mesh. This is not a fully greedy mesh since we do not check for all faces since it would be too slow to compute but rather we take advantage of the ordering of the faces so that most of the time faces can be merged together that are next to each other in the array so that only one check is necessary. With this, when rendering the entire render distance, my VRAM usage cuts from more than 4 gigabytes to 2 gigabytes, meaning my GPU's bad drivers no longer crash, and it probably could run on far more computers for larger render distances. But now we have a new problem. When the faces combine with greedy meshing, all the texture coordinates are stretched. We can fix this by passing in the size of the greedy mesh face in the texture coordinates without needing to add any new attributes. We can do this because texture coordinates are generally normalized from 0 to 1, so adding whole numbers doesn't actually interfere with the texture coordinates themselves. Then in the shader we use the size of the face to repeat the tile in the texture atlas. As a result, it renders as though they are separate faces. After all this work, we have large GPU memory savings while not compromising on mesh generation speed or the graphics of the game. Now, let's look at the comments you've made. Do you have a Discord server? I don't have a Discord server at the moment, and I feel that Discord servers work best when the community can actively participate in the project itself. At the moment, the game isn't released even in an alpha state, so it would become nothing but a glorified subscription feed for, for my channel. A good community is able to create and share contents like fan art, maps, and mods. But without the game having an identity or something tangible, the project isn't there yet, so you have to wait a bit. Why OpenGL instead of Vulkan? At the moment, I use the libgdx library, which only supports OpenGL. If I want Vulkan support, I'd have to add it in the future, which 
I probably will, because with larger render distances, the GPU becomes more of a bottleneck, and so any efficiencies gained, such as using Vulkan over OpenGL, will massively help. It will take some effort though, so it won't happen for some time. Are you using cubic chunks? At the moment, there is no hard limit on the height or the depth of the world. The only thing that cares about the height and depth is the terrain generator. Mind you, this generates a column at a time, but I could easily refactor this in the future if I, say, wanted infinite depth. Do you plan to add unique game mechanics? If it didn't have unique game mechanics, I don't think it could possibly be considered fun. In terms of movement, I would love to implement things like a grappling hook. Taking a lot of inspirations from games like Starbound, where it was easily one of my favorite items on there. But that'll have to wait till I implement the player controls. You should make sure the terrain generation isn't uniform. Good looking terrain generation is definitely a challenge, and it's something I'll prioritize after the core game mechanics are done. Minecraft's rivers and lakes aren't done particularly well, and there's no sign of volcanic activity, so it's definitely something I want to look into. Next time, I will be implementing lighting. Now that I've done all the GPU optimizations in this video, I should be able to implement it without issue. If you want to see that, stay tuned. Take care, and I'll see you next time.